Hey everybody, this is Tommy Miller. I'm the senior pastor at Legacy Church. We're really excited that you decided to join our podcast this morning. Our intention is to give you the information and the resources that you need to bring heaven to earth by walking in the fullness of your identity and your destiny. Enjoy the sermon, enjoy your day, be blessed, and do what Jesus did. Turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 11. My wife says Ephesians, because she's from the backwoods. DeAndre says Ephesians, too. I'm not sure where he's from. All right, say amen when you get there. Amen. The book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, for whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth for the body, for the edifying of itself in love." Can I pray? Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to dive into your word. Right now, I ask that you make it come to life, that you seal it in our hearts, that you open our ears and our minds to gain new paradigm on your design for humanity and our mission. Father, thank you for giving us anointing and giftings, and I just ask that you seal this word in our hearts to bear fruit a hundredfold today. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. We are in the third week of a series called Ecclesia. Everybody say Ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word that we translate to our English word church. Now, have any of you ever been in a conversation where you're saying the same thing as someone else, but you have a different understanding of what the word means, so you can't understand each other? You're talking about the same thing because you're using the same word, but essentially you have no clue what the other one's talking about. You might think that you had a successful conversation, but because you had a different foundational understanding of what you were talking about than the other person, you actually said two different things. How many of you understand that there are multiple definitions and understandings of what the word church means? And if we don't have the foundational understanding of what the church is, we will mistake and reduce the ecclesia, the called out of God, to an organization that observes traditions where we get together on Sunday mornings. Can I give you some background to the word ecclesia? Do we understand that when Jesus stepped on the scene of time and space, he did not invent a new language to speak in? So when he used words like apostles and and church, these words weren't words that the apostles and the disciples had to discover. They were words that they already knew. What I'm saying is the word church is not a religious nor a traditional word. And for us to understand the actual function of an ecclesia, we then can understand the actual mission and the foundation of the church. So, let me explain this. The definition of ecclesia is this. A called out, governing assembly. New Philly has an ecclesia. They're a few blocks down the road in a courthouse. They have multiple levels, multiple uh, hierarchical structure of leadership that is in charge of determining the culture of New Philadelphia. That it is an ecclesia. And we have to understand the root of the word ecclesia actually came from the Roman Empire. And this is why. First, let me give you... uh, This is hard to teach because... It's highly debated and really tough to understand. How many of you ever heard the, the, the Bible use the words an appointed time? An appointed time. 
So how many of you know that, that God puts the results of a particular mission in our hands? And rather than predestining what's going to happen, he foreknows what you'll do, but he leaves the results up to the church. In the, the parable of the talents, it says the kingdom of God is like a master that went away and he delivered to servants his talents. And when he got back, they had a conversation or a reckoning about what they did while he was gone. He wasn't giving them the play-by-play -play and or organizing everything that they would do. He gave them mission. He gave them provision. And then he left them to choose to be faithful with what they would do with it. So not everything in Christianity is predestined. Take the, the, the building of the ark and the flood of the earth. When did the flood come? The date of the flood was not set. God said, Noah, build an ark. Noah built the ark. He shut the door and it started raining. He wasn't in a race against time. He wasn't playing beat the clock. God was waiting for the door to shut, for him to send the rain. He says, the kingdom is, is as in the days of Noah. So what's the Bible say about the, the end? It says the end will come when? When the gospel of the kingdom is preached to all nations. So the end, it says that, that no one knows the day nor the hour. Do you know why they don't know? Because it's up to you. God foreknows, but he hasn't predestined. It's up to us and our actions. So let's, let's apply that principle to the coming of Jesus. In the book of Genesis, the concept of the kingdom was clearly spelled out to Adam and Eve. In a, in a few short words, God spoke to Adam and Eve and he said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and, and subdue it. And then he said, and he made them male and female and said, let them have dominion over the whole world. The word dominion was the word kingdom. So right from the very start, Adam and Eve had an understanding that their responsibility was to colonize the planet earth with the culture of the reality of heaven. That's their job. Adam and Eve lose both their spiritual identity and their spiritual environment. Now they are a product of what they've been through rather than what God knows, and they lose the concept and the mission of the kingdom. So, Jesus can't come back to teach about a kingdom until there is a kingdom established that he can use their vocabulary and their principles. That's why the Roman Empire had to be established before Jesus could step on the scene. Is this too much? Are you okay? I think you're okay. So when Jesus... Well, let me say this first. The Roman Empire was the only empire that operated the way the church should operate. Because if you look at the Egyptians, what they did is they went into a country, they would kidnap all their people, they would steal their stuff, and then they would bring them back to Israel and enslave them and cause them to make Israel better. But Rome was the first kingdom that said, that's not a very good idea. We, don't, we, we can get more than just people, and we can get more than just products. Why don't we try taking territory? So rather than enslaving people and stealing their stuff and bringing them back to Israel, Rome had the bright idea of going to another colony, overthrowing their current ecclesia, their governing assembly, and establishing a Roman government in a new territory. So then they would have people, they would have wealth, and they would have an expansion of their territory. They would establish a colony. So the people that Rome sent on the Romans' behalf to establish Roman culture in the new colony was called an ecclesia. Does that make more sense? The church is the visible representation of the country of heaven on this planet. When people have questions about what the nature, the values, and the character of heaven are, they should be able to look at the governing assembly of heaven placed in this colony with the responsibility to oversee its transformation and have all their questions answered. Now, let's get back into this real quick before I get too far off. Ephesians 4.11. <coughs> it says, He himself gave some to be apostles... Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I'd like to take the time 
to look at the structure, the function, and the purpose of the New Testament church. When Rome would establish a new colony, the first leader that they would send into the ecclesia was called apostolos. It's where we get our word apostle. So when the 12 apostles heard Jesus say, and you will be my apostles, they had an understanding of exactly what that meant. Because Paul himself was a Roman, and now he's an apostle. So he understood that the culture of the apostle was to bring the culture of the kingdom to the territory of the colony and make the colony look like the kingdom. But he was responsible for bringing the mind of the kingdom to the people of the colony so it looked like the kingdom rather than what it used to. You following me so far? I'll give you a good example. Miles Monroe is from the Bahamas. He's one of my favorite teachers. And the Bahamas was literally colonized by Great Britain. And when the Bahamas was colonized by Great Britain, they sent an ecclesia. They sent a new governing assembly with an apostle and with ambassadors to transform the island, the Bahamian island, to follow the culture of Great Britain. They had a tea time. They started driving on the left side of the road. They started speaking with accents. They did. That is a perfect picture. That is the exact model that Jesus used when he said, Upon this rock, I will establish my ecclesia, and you will be my apostles. You with me? So what's, what's the responsibility of the church? Is it to get people saved? I've been confused by this passage about the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Why do we see five leaders in this church, and then we only see one leader in most churches? Can I explain to you why? Because it's really important that we see the government of heaven includes a leadership team with an activated assembly. It says that he gave that fivefold ministry for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. So nobody in the body of Christ was meant to be a pew filler or a seat warmer. As a matter of fact, if we can compare it to anything, how many athletes do I have in here? Cody, what do you play? You play soccer and swim. How many soccer coaches do you have? Three. What do, they, do they each teach you something different? So you have like a running coach, like a skills coach, and then what's the third one do? Shooting. Okay. So she, she has three different coaches. And because she has the opportunity to, to be poured into by those three coaches, she is a well-rounded player. Right? But the fact is, we have to get over the days of the man of God behind the pulpit because the thought of the man of God behind the pulpit running the show has actually led to the body of Christ losing her thunder and being shoved under a rug. Because if we could equate the fivefold ministry to anything, they're not players, they're coaches. Coaches don't win games. Players do. If we were to put a spiritual scoreboard up, we should see the congregation taking the time and the initiative to score, to advance the kingdom, to take their place as the body of Christ being either a joint or, or a, a whatever, to, to stand in and do what they're called to do. Now, because Cody has the access to three coaches, she becomes uh, more agile, she becomes more skilled, and she becomes a better shooter because she gets the gifting that all three of those coaches have. So it says that God gave the apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists for the well-rounding, the perfecting of the saints so that they can change the world. You with me? All right. So let's talk about this fivefold real quick. Well, let me back up. Go, if you're still in Ephesians 4, jump up to verse 7 real quick. <clears throat> and follow me through this because it's written kind of, uh, I'll say almost cryptically. What do you do with gifts? You give them, right? You give gifts. If you receive something and they gave it to you, you didn't buy it, it's, it's classified as a gift, right? So we have to follow the language that Paul purposely and intentionally uses through this passage in order to not be confused about what he's saying. Ephesians 4, 7 says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Right? Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave 
gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? But he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth, and he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all things, that he might fulfill all things. And he himself gave. Follow me now? What's the gift that he's talking about? Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. So what he's saying is we've all received a grace. What's grace? Grace is the ability to do something that you couldn't do one second before you received the gift. We all received a grace according to the measure of the fivefold ministry that we've received. So God gave the apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists to give everybody a deposit of their gifting so they are qualified and equipped for the work of ministry. Does that make sense? Now, let's, let's discuss God's true government for church because it's really important. It says first apostles, then prophets, then teachers, then pastors, then evangelists. Why is the fourth position on the spiritual totem pole actually what we refer to the senior pastor as? Because most of the time we've got him in the wrong role. And most church divisions are caused by an environment or a culture that doesn't embrace fivefold teaching. This is why. Because each one of those fivefold giftings has a different calling and they have a different heart. If, as a matter of fact, if you can see it this way, I'll do a, a much longer teaching on this, but just follow me through this. The fivefold ministry is the funnel from heaven to earth. The apostles were the ones responsible to be in tune. As a matter of fact, the, the apostles, when it came to the needs of people, they said, what business is of, of, this, of, of this is ours? We will give ourselves continually to the prayer, prayer and the, the ministry of the word. The apostles were fluent and they were passionate about bringing the culture of heaven to earth. They were culture people. The prophets brought correction and direction to the church because they were able to spot the cracks in the wall. They were able to see divine strategy. They were able to take the culture of the apostle and, and put a strategy to buy, behind it to deliver it to the people. The teachers were be able to take the information and the strategy and put it into a program where they could actually make disciples who were ready to be fed. And the pastoral office is responsible to shepherd the sheep. They meet the needs of people. They, they visit people in the hospital. They're there to, to take care of people. And the evangelist was concerned with the lost. Do you see how the heart of heaven transcends from heaven down to earth through the fivefold ministry? Now, this is what happens. This is why churches split. Because one pastor says, no, it's all about the lost. And the other person says, no, it's all about discipleship. And another one says, no, it's all about the gifts. So they start three different churches that are all equally, excuse me, unequally yoked with the heart of heaven. And then we have churches that turn Sunday morning into a song and dance and a dog and pony show because they're so concerned about the lost that they get a church that's 75 miles wide and a half inch deep because all they care about is lost people. There's nothing wrong with evangelism. But if it's not in the context of the fivefold, it'll be unbalanced. You with me? And then the pastor that says, no, it's all about taking care of the people and making sure we have hospital visits done and making sure people are fed when they get sick. Is that wrong? Well, to an apostle, it's a, it's, a, it's a hassle because they want to be prayer and minister of the word. They said, they said what, what concern of that is ours? So listen, what I'm trying to say is this. All of these churches that have split because they think it's about something else should be working together because they bring balance to one another's ministry. Because the apostle brings a culture, the prophet brings a strategy, the teacher brings a program, the pastor brings care for the church, and the evangelist lights the hearts of the people on fire to reach the lost. And then rather than having five churches that all have a different mission statement, we have the church that has the kingdom, <laughs> the kingdom commission fully intact. Is that amazing? Now, let me ask you something. How many messages do you think I've preached? I counted yesterday. I have prepared and, and, and preached 2,500 times. If you're not good at it by then, you just give up. Like, <laughs> just stop. But can I tell you that maybe the first 500 of my messages were absolute train wrecks. They had bad information in them. They weren't doctrinal. They weren't biblical. They weren't well communicated. And they were just downright confusing. But can I tell you that there were 500 meetings that I preached in where people were merciful enough to bear with me to grow into my gift.
Can listen? One of the scariest things I've ever heard. We took Shanda's mother to a, a hospital down in Steubenville, and there's a sign on the door that says, "This is a learning hospital." I'm like, "Oh my Jesus! What does that mean?" <laughs> Sh- whoops! <laughs> you get an F. They're dead, but you get an F. <laughs> But the concept spoke to me because so often we become so consumer driven in churches that we want the best message and we want the best worship and we won't leave room for people to grow. We won't bear with somebody behind a pulpit that's shaking so bad they want to vomit, but they're stepping into their calling even though they're scared. Can we produce an environment that's conducive to growth? Can I put a young pastor behind this pulpit and not have everybody go, "Eh." (laughs) it's amazing to see somebody take that chance. It's amazing to see somebody step into their calling. Listen, can I tell you an honest story? The first message that I preached outside of youth group was a Christmas Eve service on a Saturday night at Yorksville Christian Fellowship. It was the worst message that any human has ever preached across any pulpit. And not only that, there's a gentleman by the name of David Barlock who I highly respect. He's preached here. He's a dear friend of ours, and he's been a spiritual mentor. And this is what he did, okay? Just to give you an idea of who this man is. He oversees... Oh, shoot. It just jumped to like something like 10,000 churches. He's been in the missions field for 30 years. This guy's had knives to his throat, guns to his head. He, he preaches like, a, like butter. I mean, he's just so wise, it's ridiculous. I'm preaching, and I'm not kidding. He does this to me. And then he gets out his iPad, and he starts recording me. And then when I preach and say something stupid, he goes, (laughs) And I'm like, can I just throw up and quit now? Like, it was the worst experience ever. And then he's like, can I see you in my office? I'm like, just, can somebody shoot me before I have to walk down those stairs? It was terrible. But guess what he did? He went downstairs, and he questioned everything I said. He said, do you believe You said this, this, and this. Is that really what's in the Bible? And I'm like, well, shoot, I don't know. I just thought it sounded good. (laughs) And then he says, how bad did you want to get down off that pulpit? (laughs) I'm like, I wanted to die. What do you think? The, the, The man that I have the most respect for on this planet is sitting two feet in front of my pulpit, shaking his head as I preach. Then he calls me a week later. He says, Tommy, you did an amazing job. I was just seeing if you could hang. I'm like, you... You had me crying for a week. (laughs) And he said, no, man, if you can get through that, you can get through anything. You're amazing. You did a great job. Where are we going next? I was like, oh, my God, that was the worst thing ever. But listen, the important thing is the men of God in my life gave me the opportunity to make them look bad. They sat me in front of their congregations that they fostered and loved for 30-plus years and gave me the opportunity to mess them up which thankfully I didn't because they trained me. But this is what I want to ask you. We can't be an apostle-run church forever. We need the voice of the prophet. We need the strategies of the prophet. We need the teaching of the teacher. We need the love of the pastor. And we need the fire of the evangelist in this church to function. And that means those young guys, and when I say young, I'm not talking about their age. I'm talking about their experience. If they're leading a class, honor them. If they're preaching a Sunday, honor them. They've got something to deposit in you. And we need to take the time to let them grow. Almost every church that I know is in the same circumstance right now. It's this. The pastor has tried for the last 30 years to put in a predecessor. And every time he puts in a predecessor, the the church uprises and demands their pastor back. So now we've got pastors with a foot in the grave, 75, 80, 85 years old, and the, and the church just won't let them go. So once the pastor dies, guess what happens to the church? It dies. When the church is centered around a man, it'll live as long as the man lives. When it's centered around God and his government, it'll live forever. And I hope you're hearing me. Listen, I preached this last night in Caddis, and they're like, are you leaving us? And I'm like, God, no, I'm not going anywhere. But I'm absolutely... And I'll say that again. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here to die. 
but I am absolutely passionate about seeing heaven come to earth, and, and guess what? The only model that Jesus offers us in church leadership is fivefold ministry. And it has to function, and it needs to be trained, and it needs to be released in this place. Amen? You with me so far? All right. So let's talk through this. How many of you have ever prepared for a big event before? A wedding? Graduation party? Whatever. You spend three months on the phone every single day. You spend twenty-five, sometimes $50,000 to make sure that your friends think it's a good idea. You get to that day. It lasts 45 minutes. And it's like somebody stole all the wind out of your sails. It's over. And you're just trying to breathe life back into this moment. You call people. You're like, how was it? Did you like it? Oh, it's great. It's a wedding. No, no, no. I mean, I spent my entire life in $25,000 on this. You better tell me it was life-changing. Make my investment of time and money worth it. And you just keep trying to make these moments stay alive, right? But when they're over, what do you do? You have to live. And what I fully believe is that we've become so focused on the crux of Christianity being our Sunday morning meeting. When in reality, this is the one we prepare for. This is where the loud music is. This is where the lights are. This is where people get healed and delivered. What happens on Monday? Because if our Monday doesn't look how our Sunday felt, we were here on Sunday for no reason. You with me? So this is what I want to bring you to. Turn to Acts chapter 2. One of my favorite things to do as a very mean pastor is this. When somebody misses a church service, they call me on Monday, they're like, hey, sorry I wasn't there, how was it? You know what my response always is? Bro, you totally missed it. Like, best service ever. Ask them, they know. It's true. But could you imagine being the one that missed the meeting in Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2, Jesus commands this group of people to go and wait in the upper room. They said, you go, tarry in the upper room. The Holy Spirit's going to fall on you. You'll be filled with power. So they go to the meeting. And while they're at the meeting, they get a phone call. Say, hey, bro, sorry, my kid's got a soccer game. No, it's all good. I'll catch you up. Don't worry. We'll talk Monday. And then they get there, and a rushing wind fills the room. Their heads catch on fire, and they start speaking other languages. Best church service ever. What do you do after you experience something like that? <laughs> Get some water. <laughs> you have to live. You understand if we aren't able to, to rightly apply or rightly translate what we experience when we're being equipped to everyday life, being equipped is completely null and void. There's no reason. So we have to be able to take those upper room moments and being able to make them transcend and be interpreted in everyday life. Now, what's beautiful is there is so much content in Acts chapter 2. It shows us what the New Testament church actually looked like. And that church was a group of people that did life together 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It wasn't a building that people met in two or three nights a week. So let's look. I have eight things that I can point out directly following Acts chapter 2 that they did to make sure that they sustained what they experienced in that meeting. How many of you understand that our job is to not take what we experience on Sunday and make people experience it on Monday? That's just weird. It's just weird. If you walk up to your coworker and like, shut it up, like, what? <laughs> Jesus, what'd you do? It's called tongues. It's great. Like, <laughs> keep that guy away from me. But how can we release the kingdom in a way that's that's interpreted and received by humanity and make it look like real life? Because that's what the ecclesia, the called out, the governing assembly is called to do. Number one is this. They moved in a lifestyle of faith. What that means 
is that they were willing, after the, the hype on Sunday, they were willing to walk the walk on Monday. As a matter of fact, it was after the hype that those who believed were baptized. How many of you believe? Like four? Whoa! We need to start over. Okay, of those people that believe, how many of you haven't been water baptized yet? All right, the baptistry is going to be full the first Sunday in February because that is your next step of obedience. The book of James says this, check this out. It says, someone will say to you, I have faith and I have works. Say, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But do you know a foolish man that faith without works is dead? Meaning that what they experienced on Sunday translated and was visible to their Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. They committed to a lifestyle of faith. Listen, if we have a healing service in here and we're not willing to pray for the sick out there, might as well quit. If we believe that God delivers people from depression, anxiety, and bondage here, we're not willing to to break chains out there, we might as well quit. You with me? Because faith without action is destitute of life. It's dead. Number two, they committed to a lifestyle of corporate growth. Now, let let me hit on this one. Not because I'm a senior pastor and I've got a bias or skin in the game, but understand this. The very first church on the very first day had 3,000 people. And one of the things that people call me and say all the time is like, we really like your church, and we went to so-and-so in church and so-and-so in church, but we want to come to yours because it's smaller. I'm like, then you better find another one. Because if it stays like that, we might as well quit. Because our responsibility is... To bring people in to the kingdom. As a matter of fact, this is, this is a, my wife sometimes. My kids hate the fact that my wife's cool. They hate it. Like she's 40 and young girls like her and they want to dress like her and they like her sense of humor. She's super cool. See? Cool wife. My kids hate it. It's like the worst thing that could ever happen when your mom's actually cool. So they try to keep her at bay as often as they can. They're like, you're lame, you're lame, you're lame. They try. It just doesn't work. So when she tells a story, they go like this. Do you know what that is? It's a story basket. That's where you put lame stories that you don't want to bring up anymore. (laughs) So when my poor wife talks, who's actually cool, my kids go. She's like, stop it. (laughs) So when people come and they say, I like your church because it's small. I don't like those big churches. I'm like. Because that's not the heart of God. And if you want to know why your experience in a big church was bad, it's because it's not governed by a fivefold and there is an authentic community there. I'm not saying that big churches are the right churches, but what I am saying is that when we set the foundation for what the ecclesia actually is, and we provide an environment where you can find a small family to belong to that's not forced. Listen, small groups that you attend two times a month are not a family. They can turn into one but that's not the end of one. A family is somebody that you call every day, that you can rely on day or night. Those are authentic relationships. We believe that small groups lead into those kind of things, but just because you're in a small group does not mean you have a community. Right? There's nothing wrong with big churches, but if there isn't a functioning fivefold and an avenue to make authentic relationships, it's not good. You with me? So... They committed to a lifestyle of corporate growth. It said this. That day, say that day, 3,000 souls were added to them. Pretty good day, right? We get excited when we get two visitor cards. That day, 3,000 souls were added to them. Number three, they lived a lifestyle of personal growth. And it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines. That means that they not only committed to a good experience on Sunday, they committed to good teaching throughout the week. As a matter of fact, it says that they observed the apostles' doctrines and prayer daily. Number four, they committed to a lifestyle of fellowship. This is actually the point that led me to my message last week that I didn't intend on speaking. Authentic community within the church is the only way that the church can actually survive for any amount of time. Seeing each other on Sunday morning is not a sufficient relationship with somebody to have authentic, transparent relationship with them. Listen, we started the academy 
Two weeks ago, we've had two meetings. And in two meetings, we've created the environment of transparency, authenticity, and vulnerability. And in those two meetings, there's families being created in two meetings. When we're in here on a Sunday morning, we have to purposely create the environment of transparency, vulnerability, and authenticity in order for us to actually have a relationship with one another. When people ask you how you are, be able to discern whether or not they care, but then be vulnerable enough to tell them. Because when you tell somebody how you are, you come into the environment where you can get real, and only in the environment where you can get real can you ever get right. Iron sharpens iron. So this is what it said. It said, they, they gathered in fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Your small group meeting does not have to be mini church. You don't have to have worship. Don't even bring your Bibles. Order pizza, hang out, talk about life. It needs to happen. I met with a doctor the other day who does not believe in his craft. He said that they're responsible now to prescribe medication, and he is so certain because of his structure and function background that the body was designed by God, even the fallen body, to heal itself. When something gets injured, it swells. Why does it swell? Because it's sending blood, oxygen, and nutrients to that area to heal it. Right? When you slam your finger in a door, what do you do? Five other fingers come to its aid. It's one of the most beautiful things that God designed the body to do, is take care of itself. When you're going through something, God has placed authentic, transparent people around you that you can call on. The problem is most of us don't think anyone cares. As a matter of fact, my wife have adopted this theory. How many of you ever said, said this to someone? If you need anything, call me. Raise your hand if you said that. Yeah. How many phone calls did you get? Zero. Do you know why? Because people aren't willing to be vulnerable and transparent. So this is what you have to do to start a vulnerable and transparent relationship. You have to ask yourself what you would actually want in that circumstance and then do it for them. When people go into surgeries and stuff and we say, hey, do you want food cooked? I've never had anyone say yes. Never. They're like, no, we're fine. We'll order pizza or, you know, I've got a super chick at home that made 75 months of freezer meals or something like that. Like, let's not ask anymore. Let's just extend the gesture to show that we're in this together. And when you suffer, I suffer. Authentic community breeds authentic relationships. And those are the kind of relationships that carry us through a lifestyle like this. After Sunday, there has to be authentic relationships through the week in order for it to stay sustained. Now, number five. They lived a lifestyle of reverence. It says in Acts chapter 2, then fear came upon every soul. The word fear in the Greek language in the New Testament means reverence and respect. That means their actions were actually governed by the love that they had for God. So in these relationships, the Bible says, as you've done unto the least of these, you've done unto me. What directed their actions was not the need of humanity, it was the love that they had for Jesus. Number six, my favorite, because I'm a junkie for this kind of stuff, is they li lived a supernatural lifestyle. It says, and many signs and wonders were done through the hands of the apostles. So not only were they experiencing fire on people's head on Sunday, they were putting fire on people's head on Monday. As a matter of fact, by Acts chapter 3, by Acts chapter 3, the very next chapter, Peter and John are walking to the temple, and they see a, a lame man on the side of the road. And he says, look at us. And, he's, and they say, silver and gold I don't have because I'm a pastor. But what I have in the name of Jesus I give you. Get up and walk. So after that huge meeting that they experienced, two guys are just walking to the temple to get some reading done for the day. And they pass somebody that can't walk. And what do those two men do? They pick up the lame man. They live a supernatural lifestyle. As a matter of fact, let me tell you that one of the most influential things that you can do for humanity is trust God. I ask my sons all the time. I, I, I keep them. I said, are you trusting God in front of your wife? Because all of us have fallen into financial issues, right? Do we pull our hair out and freak out and like sell things and do all that stuff? Or do we trust God? Because one of the most amazing things about our life is we can tell you to trust God and then we can show you where God has provided for us. Where God has saved our children's lives. Where God has saved our lives. Where God has saved our finances. Where God has brought 
finances into this church at dire moments. He has never let us down. And because of that, because we've had the opportunity to trust God, it's no longer just a theory anymore. We know God in areas that everybody needs to know him. Amen? I'm almost done, I think. <clears throat> Number eight, they lived a fruitful lifestyle. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily. Say daily. Those who are being saved. I skipped seven. Julie, thank you so much. And if you don't mind, number seven was a generous lifestyle. Those who believed had all things in common. They sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as anyone had need. That means if you were part of a church family, your church family took care of you. Understand what happened here wasn't socialism. It was a very special event where a bunch of Jews and Gentiles put faith in Jesus. And therefore, by putting faith in Jesus, they left their former culture of Judaism or, or, the, or the Romans. In either case, they would have left their former employment, their former faith, and their former friends. So now this group that just got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the upper room comes down and now they have 3,000 people who are leaving everything to follow Jesus. So this group of people that have things sold everything so that the 3,000 could be taken care of. And by Acts chapter 5, we actually still see fruit. There's a daily distribution. The entire church is taken care of because of the wealth that was in the church that was supplied to the people that had need. It was amazing. Stand with me. I'll quit. <clears throat> Number eight, a fruitful lifestyle. This is my favorite part of this passage. It says that those were added to the church daily, those who were being saved. Not on Sunday. Not during the healing conference. Not when Dan Moeller comes. Daily. Because they were breaking bread from house to house, having gladness, favor, and simplicity at heart, and, and favor with all the people. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. So salvations don't just happen on Sunday. This is a room, this is a building, this is a temple for equipping saints for the work of ministry. And the way that church culture has been previously is somebody whispers in the pastor's ear, Hey, my unsaved niece is back there. Make sure you give her hell and brimstone. <laughs> like, No! You give her the gospel at your dinner table. Bring her here, and we'll equip her for, the, for, for ministry. People were led to the Lord at dinner tables, not at altars. Amen? We're going to skip to Acts chapter 6 to close here. It says this. It said, in those days, the number of disciples was multiplying. That's good news. And there arose a, a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It's not desirable that we would leave the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, that you can appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to the prayer and the, the ministry of the word and the saying, Please the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, Philip, and a bunch of other names that I can't pronounce, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them, and the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So do you understand what just happened? There was a moment in the church where that they, they were stuck in this bubble. The people weren't being taken care of. There was contention. The people weren't happy. And they said, listen, the answer to our problem is to activate the people in our seats to take their place in the kingdom. It said that this saying pleased the whole multitude. What that tells me is most of the people sitting in the church today don't know their calling, their value, or the need that humanity has for them to step out of their seat and into their mission so that the world can receive what they have. And it says, at that moment, when the people took the responsibility that they determined that this wasn't our church, this was my church, and I'm going to do what it takes to make sure that it thrives and it lives forever. When they stepped into those positions, it says, now the number of disciples multiplied greatly. Our ability to reach our city is completely dependent upon our ability to adopt God's government of the fivefold ministry and equip saints to go out there and do what they're called to do. Now, in this culture that God designed, He actually designed equality all the way across the board. The apostle is not more valuable, nor is he more important 
than the guy that's preaching the gospel in his workplace. He's not. He just simply has a different role. So understand that all of us have a gifting and all of us have a lack. And the Bible says that if you receive a prophet in the name of the prophet, you'll receive what the prophet has to give you. So the key to moving in authentic community is honoring the people around you, honoring the teachers that teach you. Because when you honor somebody for who they are, you receive the impartation of what they have. How many of you have sat in a church service like with a guest speaker or something, and before he even took the pulpit, you didn't want to hear him because you wanted to hear somebody else? Raise your hands. Right? So guess what? Biblically, spiritually, you just put a wall between him and the impartation that he has to offer you. Honor means you recognize somebody for who they are so you can receive what God has deposited in them and, and fill the need that you have. Every single person around you has a deposit, a gifting, a calling, and a, and a piece of the body that you need to experience in your life. And creating a culture that thrives on that thought means that whoever's behind this pulpit gets the honor of the people in the seats. doesn't matter who it is. And I'm not trying to, like, chastise anybody, but listen. If I announce a guest speaker and you, keep, and you skip church because I announced the guest speaker, you're telling God that you dishonor a calling that he placed in another man's life that he sent here to pour into you and you're probably going to miss out on something really important with that attitude we all have our favorites right I have mine if I went to a Miles Monroe conference even though he's passed and I stepped behind the pulpit I'd leave too <laughs> but developing a culture where everybody values everybody and everybody knows that they have something to give is the culture that, that the ecclesia the governing assembly was made to walk in so that we could transform the culture of the city that we live in. We're not supposed to just lead people to salvation. We're supposed to teach them what to value. We're supposed to teach them what to care for. We're supposed to teach them what they're capable of and who God says they are. And it doesn't just change the eternal future of somebody's life. It changes the current state of the community that we live in. And I have grandchildren that need us to understand this so that it's a little harder for them to pick up a needle and shove it in their arm. So the culture of nihilism and meaningless and purposeless lives leaves because that is the number one thing that leads people to make bad decisions is they don't think that they're wanted or they're needed. And the fact is we desperately need their gifting. We desperately need their calling and we desperately need to honor them to get what we can receive from them. Every human that you meet deserves the honor of God. Can I just pray over you? That's what I, that's what I feel like we're supposed to do. Would you put your hand in the air just to recognize that you're willing to fall in to this government, this establishment, this governing assembly and take your place in the ranks that God has called you to. Father, right now, I thank you for imparting an apostolic grace to these people. That they would see and manifest the culture of heaven. Father, right now, I, I, I speak to those people that are called to those fivefold offices. God, and we impart and we recognize them to fully embrace their calling. And God, I ask right now that this culture sustain a culture that honors our fellow human so that not only are they valued wherever they go, but Father, we receive the giftings that you've placed in the people that you've put around us, Father. And I thank you for making this place a powerhouse. Father, right now I ask that fire fall on each one of our heads, God, that we be re-anointed, we, uh, we be filled to the top so that we overflow in the very gifting and calling that you've called us to. So Father, today send your Holy Spirit to speak to us, embrace to us, and clarify our giftings. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Would you do me a favor and give the Lord a shout this morning? Amen.